these things, and we hope it's going to help you. Oh, okay. <laughs> and so, what we were facing was that, as I said, they want to go native, but it's kind of overwhelming. I mean, all of us chapters have had all kinds of documents. We have resource lists, we have plant lists, we have pictures. You know, and I and I go out and I speak to people. I have people come to our plant sales and I start handing them stuff, and you can just see that they're in the headlines. You know, that it is overwhelming. And that's where we need to find some new tools. And non natives is one that might come of come of age, we'll see. But this is one that um, frankly I stole it from the Verde chapter, and you'll see about that in here. Uh, but what I want to think about is how do we approach new people to the native plant world and how do we make it easy for them? Because it can be, it, it's just, it can be very difficult. So the first thing we want to know is how do we find them? Well, obviously, if we post our stuff everywhere we can find, that helps. I get into quite some conversations on next door. I'm sorry, I've got one tonight. I get into quite some conversations on next door. And in fact, over the last week, there's been this ongoing thread about none of the shrubs look good in the winter. So I went out in my backyard and just took pictures. I posted pictures. Here's a Texas mountain laurel. They're fabulous. You know, here's a um, kidney wood. No leaves, but very sculptural. You know, and just a bunch of them like that. And so, you know, here's some ideas. So, there's lots of places where we might not think about posting stuff. We want to just post. Talk to strangers. You do not want to be next to me at the nursery or at the grocery store or in church. I will talk to you. I carry business cards from, you know, we have a Trinity Forks business card. I carry those with me, hand them out. Here's Trinity Forest to tell you what to plant. Here's Master Gardeners to tell you how to plant it. You know? um, like I said, hand out your business card. If y'all don't have business cards for your chapter, I think you do. Make sure, you know, keep 10 to 15 in your purse. Just hand them out. And watch for booth and speaking opportunities. They, all these different organizations that are having Earth Day events and environmental fairs, and oh man, we're so green, and they don't even go do a search to find out what organizations are out there. You know, I happen to be a speaker for the Master Gardeners in Denton, so I see all the speaker requests come through, I see all the event requests come through, and I just grab them and call them up and go, hey, would you like to have a Native Plant Society booth? And they're like, oh yeah, we didn't even know about it. Yeah, well, we were there last year, you know? <laughs> But anyway, so watch for these things. Now, how do we get them converted? This is where I think we sometimes fall short because we start out with, oh, it's better for the wildlife. Not everybody wants to say some spiders in their yard. You know, I'm happy to have them, but they don't necessarily. Or we start out with, well, you know, there's no water. And you're going to have to stop watering, and your yard's going to look terrible. It's just so grim and sad, you know? Let's try starting with hey, we can cut your maintenance in half. We can cut your cost by two thirds. You know, there's a lot of really positive things. We want to show them how to convert an existing landscape. There's very few people who don't have something that they at least think looks like a landscape. Now there's some that don't, okay? And there's some that have, you know, what the HOA thought looked like a landscape, or what their builder thought looked like a landscape, but they know that they need to change it. So we want to show them how to do that over time, because when they go Callaway's up here and look at plants, those are a lot cheaper and easier to get to than a lot of the natives that we're going to try to get them to plant. So we need to help them understand why it's worth their while to use native. And we need to manage their expectations. That means cluing them in that they're still going to have to water for at least the first year, two for shrubs, three for trees. 
and that they're still going to have to cut back in the in the spring. It's not a no maintenance plan. And a lot of people come into it thinking, oh, I, no maintenance. No, it's not a no maintenance plan. And no, they probably won't grow on your urban lot that's never had the soil amended. Because all that beautiful prairie or cross timber soil that used to be there was carried off by your builder. So you've got to rebuild the soil even when you're planting native plants. You can't just dig a hole and throw it in there and walk away. We need to help them fit into their neighborhood aesthetic. We don't want these folks to be the one that has a front yard that has the code guy over there all the time. Or their neighbors are looking at them and shaking their heads. We want it to help them make it look like something that belongs there. It's intentional. What I tell them is, look, if you make a bed and put some kind of nice border around it, Nobody's going to complain about what's going on in that bed. But if you take that same group of plants and just throw them in the middle of your lawn, you're going to be the dirty guy on your block. So go get some stones, build a border, and then put your plants in. So this is, from here on, this presentation is one that I give to the Master Gardener interns in Denton County every year. Because it, and it's like one of the first or second classes, because we want to get them interested in natives where I play. We want them to think about where their plants come from. Because if your plants don't come from this area, they're not going to be happy here. I don't care how many hollies you have, Japanese hollies. We want to talk about the hardiness map. How many of y'all use this map to pick out plants? Yeah, we all use it. We all used it for years because we thought, man, this is the be all. I mean, what zone are you in? I hear that. So, what zone are you in? I have no idea. And I really don't care because this map, A, hasn't been updated in a while, and we're all a zone or two hotter than we were when it was put together. And B, it doesn't think about our high temperatures, and it doesn't think about our temperature swing. And those are the two things that kill plants here more than anything. When it's 80 degrees in the afternoon and 30 degrees that night, there's a lot of plants that are not going to stand for that. But the native plants will. And it doesn't talk about how much rain we get and how we get it. I can't help it. Somebody else go open the door for me. Oh, I'm sorry. A question? <laughs> well, I knew um, Texas had four seasons, but I didn't know they did occur all in one day. It's <laughs> <laughs> exactly true. You know, and it's really not unusual in spring and fall or, or even in winter um, for us to have a 30 or 40 degree temperature swing in 24 hours. You know? So that's hard. Dallas and Portland, Oregon had the same average annual rainfall, 36 inches. Does Portland get the same rain that we get? No. Portland gets a quarter of an inch all the time. We get 18 inches one day in May and 18 inches one day in, in November. You know? It's a whole different world for the plants here than it is for the ones in Portland. And where do most of the plants where the biggest nursery industry shipping out, either from the southeast or the northwest. Not us, sorry. Obviously, let's talk about our soils, our geography. We have a lot of different soils here. They don't talk about rivers and streams. The wind, that's a whole separate thing for plants here. I mean, the wind will just simply truly blow them away. So there's lots of things that this, that this chart doesn't talk about. But if you just plant natives, you don't have to worry about it as much. So 96% of birds feed caterpillars to their young. That means for one brood, they need between six and 9,000 caterpillars. It is amazing to me that there's any butterflies left if we're eating that many caterpillars. 
We know from um, Doug Hellman's research that oaks host 534 species of butterflies and moth or insects in, in this area. Chinese mustache has zero. zero. So we know that the beautiful things, the butterflies and the moths and the stuff like that that we like, eat plants, right? And they're going to eat the ones that they are programmed to eat, you know, by their heritage, by what they grew up. So if nothing is eating your plants, your landscape is not part of the ecosystem. And we don't have enough open land in this area to have any of it that's not part of the ecosystem. We just don't. So let's talk about how native plants grow. They grow here because they love our soils. They can handle drought and flood. They can handle the heat. All of these pictures were taken in our yard. Um, I put things on the ones that I wanted to make sure to point out. This is a mountain wall up here. It's that very spot in front of it. That picture was in the middle of last summer's 100 degrees, no, no rain. I mean, we had a mountain laurel that had died to the ground. We cut them off and it sprouted. The root sprouts came up. And by the end of the drought, they were this high. Then when it started raining, it was just like, we don't know what to do with all this water. <laughs> the flame of Kansas, that was there in the middle of July. Then there's our coral berry and our coral honeysuckle, April 2021. Y'all remember what happened in February 2021? That was the big freeze. You can't even tell it looking at that. There's one of Carol's pictures. I have a lot of Carol's pictures. <laughs> Once established, they thrive on natural rainfall. So we need to help them remember one year for vines, ground covers, and flowering plants, you got to water. It's just a baby plant, it needs to get its roots out. Two years if it's a shrub or a small tree, an ornamental. Three years if it's a big tree. Give these plants a chance. Let them get their roots down. How many of y'all have seen this picture? Everybody's seen this picture, and we all know the importance of it. This root system is what enables native plants to survive the droughts and the floods and the heat and the cold. It's also the reason it takes them three years to become really good plants to really take off because it's putting that root system down. And that's when I said, be straight with your new people and tell them this is what's happening. This is what's going to happen. That gorgeous salvia gray guy that you're taking home is going to look just like that two years from now. But it's going to have a good root system and it'll take off after that. So this is an elderberry plant that Pat put in, I guess about 2016. I love it. It's a, it's a, I, at the time I didn't, but I do now. So here it is in Mark, uh, May of 2018. There it is in August. I thought that it was like that because of the heat and the drought that year. It turns out that elderberry does that every year because it protects itself from heat and drought. But that's okay. We happen to have a kidney wood right next to it, and it's blooming just about the time the elderberry is dropping all its leaves, so nobody notices the elderberry anymore. And then there it is four weeks later. It's starting to come back. Now, here it is the following year. Do you think it was hurt by dropping all its leaves in the summer? No. That protected that plant. There it is in 2021 after the freeze. Did the freeze hurt it? No. It's even bigger than it was then. Unfortunately, I didn't get a picture of it this year because we were gone. But anyway, so we want our landscapes to reflect the botanical heritage of the area in which we live. So how do we get started with that? Well, we can add natives to existing landscapes. This is the, this is the spot where we can best help a newbie figure out what to do. Okay, do you have a plant that's dead or dying or just unhappy? Let's take it out and put in a native that would be happy in that environment. 
I talked to so many people that are buying big old flats of petunias and pansies. And I'm like, you know, when you get all those plants, you got all those little pots you got to deal with. If you just put in some natives, some perennials, once you planted them one time, you wouldn't have to do this again. That $25 flat, you wouldn't be buying it next year. We want to really encourage them to add flowering understory trees. We have a lack of that height in our landscapes in this area. And we want to remind them that they do need to put plants with similar light and water requirements together. I see so many people, they're like, oh, look, I'm going to plant this, this uh, black foot daisy right here where my water thing drips all the time. You know, I'm like, well, if you want to plant another one, another one. <laughs> Oops. Oh, yeah. And we don't, we want to help them not overwhelm themselves. If we do a really good job of selling natives, they're going to get so excited, they're going to go home and rip out their whole landscape, and then they're not going to be able to get it all replanted, and then they're going to be angry at native plants when it's not their fault. You know, so let's help them focus, and that's what this presentation is about. So you can go all in, or you can do something more traditional. I'll be honest with you, I try to point more people towards the traditional side because that's I live in Flower Mound, right on Morris Road. Everybody drives by my house. If I did this, I would have problems. If you can get by with this, go for it. But you can go very traditional and still have a beautiful native landscape. So here's a way to do that. Is to create theme gardens. It allows you to plan for year-round beauty. Again, locate plants with similar water and sun requirements together. And plant groups plants in drifts of three, five, and you'll see where that comes in here in a minute. So here's some ideas, and we're going to very quickly look at each one of these. Janet is going to make available to you all the plant garden layouts that I'm going to show you with their list tomorrow. Okay, they'll be up or posted or probably we don't share information. So this was stolen from the Guadalupe chapter. I guess it's not really so. They gave me permission to take it. <laughs> I took it. I updated it a little bit for North Central Texas, although their plant list wasn't really that different from what grows here. Um, they are using it in their NICE program. And I saw this at a state conference. And what they do, where we have like a plant of the season, they have a garden of the season. And they do the whole garden. And they put up posters in their nice nurseries and people can come and get a copy of the layout. And the nurseries love it because the shopping list on there is all three or five or something. It's not one or two. So it's a good thing. Anyway, so here are their cool batteries just went down. Whoops. Okay, so the first one is the Burton Butterfly Garden. And one of their chapter members did these lovely um, pictures. Well, now it's working again. I know it's still good. All right. Um, here's the layout. Now, the good thing about this is all of these gardens are not something you might want to put in your yard, but it does give you an idea of plants that go together well. You know, you can put these plants together well, and you're going to be successful. And generally, there's only four or five plants in each garden. Um, and, it, and it gives you an idea of how to lay them out. You won't be as good as Carol, but at least it'll look decent. So in this one, they have flame canvas, butterfly milkweed, blue mist, flower, coral honeysuckle, and then a trellis and mulch and benches and all that sort of thing. So fun. You can repeat this same garden 18 times all the way around your fence if you want. So flame of canthus, y'all are familiar with it. Three to four foot high shrug, gorgeous, sunny, hummingbird magnet, um, low water, also home to crimson patch and 
I want to check a spot. There we go. Um, just a very wonderful plant. It does take the whole three years before it takes off, though. It does. A uh, butterfly milkweed, uh, tuberosa. We want to make sure that we encourage them to look for that tuberosa on the label. Um, we don't know they grow three, three feet high, maybe uh, about one to two feet wide. That fence right there. A couple of years ago, we had twelve pistols running down the fence. <laughs> it was very exciting. Um, Hose for the monarchs, of course. Plant them in a group. And there's also the other um, native milk waste of this area. The mist flowers. We have blue mist flower and we have gray mist flower. Everybody has their favorite. How many of y'all between these two prefer blue mist flower? Yeah, two, three. How many prefer Greg's mist flower? Yeah. That's just the way it is because Greg's mist flower has those very cool leaves and that chartreuse coloring that really shows up. I prefer the blue one because it blooms a little bit later, right when the monarchs are coming through. And the monarchs are hungry coming south. So that's what we have. We do have some greds, but we have a lot more blue than we do greds. It's spread. If y'all notice that, it does spread. <laughs> yeah, it's spread. Um, it doesn't. It doesn't need a lot of water, and it is quite delectable to all kinds of butterflies. Then we have coral honeysuckle. It can climb a lot. It spreads if you let it, but you can keep it under control with your garden, with your kitchen shears. You know, you can have wild and crazy like we do, or you can have something on a lamp post like that. It's just up to you. Uh, that's the picture that was taken the April after the big trees. Then they have the pastel colors garden. So sweet. Mexican plum or a Texas red bud. Uh, columbine, some prairie verbena, and rock rose. So there's the Mexican plum. Everybody in here got a Mexican plum? Great tree. Tells you when spring's here. First thing to bloom. Or a Texas red bud. There's our red buds the year of the great trees. They did all right. Marble host the Henry Elton. <laughs> And I have actually seen those butterflies running around. They're very cute. They're tiny. Columbines. Man, I love columbines. They give me that bright yellow in a dark spot. You know, it's hard to get color in the shade, but we have a ton of columbines in them because it's lots of yellow in a dark, shady spot. They do need a little more water. These that are these pictures here. Those are in dense shade. Dense. Prairie verbena. This is one we need to really help people with because it's one, it's probably the second most hybridized plant in the nursery industry. I got so excited the first time I went to a nursery and they had all these different colors of verbenas. I thought, well, isn't that cool? And I started looking at it all annuals. So they're not native, they're hybridized. So there's a good chance that the insects are not even gonna be able to see them, let alone feed on them. So we really wanna plant them to or point our newbies to the prairie verbena, the purple ones, the perennial ones. You just tell them get purple and perennial, they can probably remember that when they get to the nursery. Rock rose. Yay! Another Jimmy Buffett fan. <laughs> um, rock rose, obviously not really a rose. It's a part of the hibiscus family. Uh, it's a great plant. It is one that fountains out, so you need to have a plan for keeping it corral. There's that hibiscus. Here's the mailbox garden. A lot of people like this, but we have stuff playing around our mailbox. I think it's a lot of fun. 
The one thing you really got to keep in mind is the leave and approach to the mail carrier. When I was a kid, my mother had lantana all around the mailbox. Our mailman was not happy, and I was punished by having to go get the mail. So, anyway, for this one, they had Zizmania, feather grass, and colberry, and then a bunch of red guttas. I kind of think I got those labeled backwards because the red guttas seem to be like they ought to be off the back where the three is, but either way, red guttas were wonderful. Here they are, not really yuccas, but we love them. These are a great plant if you're looking for a foundation planting in front of a window. Because they're short, they're very pretty, and when they bloom, the bloom pops up and it's right at eye level in the window. And then it seeds out and you have these cool looking seed pods and then you just go cut it off. Great plant for in front of a window. It's really important when you're planting your landscape to go inside and look out the windows and see what you're going to see. I mean, we've all at some point had a house that had a holly bush in front of the window, right? Anyway, coral berries is my favorite shrub in the whole world because it has these adorable little bitty leaves. They're just lacy. It's like a giant maidenhair fern. They're just so pretty. Don't get it for the for the berries. They're very cool and the birds and the wildlife love them, but you're never hardly going to see them. Um, at least not much. It's a great shrub. It doesn't get much taller than three or four feet. I'm not sure it even gets to four feet. Um, yeah, they're good in the shade. That one is under our Mexican plum. So it's 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 got leaves on it right now. Not a lot, but a few. Since then, when, when we did level one, Carol was one of our teachers, and since me it came up, and I was like, I've never heard of that. I've heard of most of these other plants. And then about a year later, I ran into it at Callaway, because they had a whole bunch of them. I, was, I had to go congratulate the manager. I was like, good for you. So the thing about this mania is that it really does need a, at least a couple of years to get its roots down. But you can see here early May 2020, it starts blooming early in the spring. And then late May, it, it just keeps getting bigger and bigger all year. There it is in September. I mean, this is a fantastic plant in September. Now, that plant is outside our fence. It gets no irrigation whatsoever. Um, it's even way past the hole I was putting the fence to get a hose through for the drought last year. It just sits there and blooms like that. And that's the alley going the other way. It's just an amazing plant. It does get to be two to three feet wide, which is what it says on the labels. It really does that, y'all. <laughs> it takes it three years, but it really does. Yes, sir. Once you have it, you have a lot of <laughs> That's true. That's true. You can. Now, mine's in a bed, and when I cleaned it last year, I didn't find a lot of babies. Do you have a lot of babies? Oh, okay. Well, maybe I need to look harder. I, it's just a great plan. Mexican feather grass, probably one of the most commonly known um, natives, and, and certainly a great opportunity, especially if you have areas where you're going to have like boulders or something. They look so full of boulders. Okay, Texas Moon Garden. Moon gardens have become pretty popular um, because they have all things that are white or silver in them. They're great at night. And um, here's their plan they have a Sumiso, some Blackfoot Daisy. Barley sage and the mealy blitz sage. There's a Seniso. We've all seen these. They come in silver, they come in green. Um, this is one I recommended to all my neighbors that could get a bush to look good in the winter. Um, great plant. Swallow tails, and you can see that swallow tail up there. Only took me about three hours to get that one picture. <laughs> um, Long well, almost to the checker spot there. Is that, is that what's called Texas 
Yes, it is. It's Texas Day, also known as the Days of. Can you trim that back or? Oh, yes. Yes. Oh, yeah. If you don't trim it back, it will get to be too late. Um, and it'll get thin. So, yeah, we keep trimming ours back. So, we cut them down to knee height bathhouse, and they come back just better each time. Yeah. Henry Blue also known as Henry Gilbert. Y'all know Henry Gilbert, right? That great Texas botanist? No. <laughs> no. Um, it's found growing on his grave, the white version on his wife, Augustus' grave. So it's kind of fun to get a photo. I will note that the blooms on the white Augusta Gilbert say are much larger than the ones on the blue Henry Gilbert. But they're both very, very pretty. Um, we happen to have this one in a bed with red salvia gray guy, yeah, so we have a red, white, and blue bed. We don't have any white, it's just red. <laughs> Um, this is a great plant. It starts blooming in March and it just keeps on going. Yes, ma'am. We've had the case where um, Augustus taken over. It will. Okay, is that typical that it will? I mean, you say you have no white. We've got big well, beds of white where we planted blue, and now that they're, they're moving all around our our bed, which yeah. is fine in that setting. I've heard that, that the blue will go to white over time. Now, we've had those in for about, what, about 10 years, and it's still blue. I, I bought one on that. Well, we have two on Gus's, and they're each about 50 feet away from this plant. So I, I don't know if that has any bearing on it. Yeah, we put a, one or two Augustus in a bed of Henry's just to get some color contrast. And now it's Augustus' bed with one or two. Yeah. I planted uh, the Henry, the blue, and the following year, uh, it's had seeded out in another bed as Augusta. Yeah, I've heard things happening. Yeah. I've heard of the women, you know, just like you see that, that there'll be white blues coming up in the middle of the blue. You know, so, you know, make a plan you can be a little picky about that sort of thing, you know? This is a relaxed, a relaxed approach to landscaping. Barley sage, so, boy, we've done so many of these out and threw them away for so long, and here we are telling everybody this is what you need to plant. It's a cool plant. I mean, what a great ground cover. Look at the great leaves with the red veins in them. And then you just go out there one spring and surprise, you got little big flowers everywhere. Yes, sir. For, for people who are newbies, this is a great ajuga substitute. That's right. It is. It's an excellent, excellent substitute for ajuga. It's a good, uh, in a shade plant, a good shade ground cover. Um, it does need to be fairly well drained. And it, it blooms early in the year, but still, you got that great, the great leaves out there. And blackfoot daisies. How many of y'all have killed the blackfoot daisies? How many of you have killed more than ten blackfoot daisies? <laughs> I have killed over fifty. Of them. I have no doubt. Then I read about them. Carol taught me about them. She said, "Liz, they need dry. They don't like to be wet." So I moved it outside my fence and as happy as they can be. And one thing about them I have found is that in general, they tend to have about a four year life cycle on the plant. So I have about four areas and every year I buy an English for one of them. So we just keep moving around. But they're so well worth it. Us children of the 60s, you gotta love the Blackfoot Daisies. Yes, ma'am. I've been blessed that my house, many people have heard me talk about this, that they jumped over from my yard, my big part, my garden, mm -hmm. into my health strip. Oh. This and Warner daisies now fill my health strip. I did not plant a single plant there. And until this summer, I never watered a plant there. And one year, I in a talk, I said I thought I had over 100. 
um, former daisies. And then I thought I really better check because I don't want to exaggerate. And so I started counting at one end and I got about two thirds down when I hit a hundred. And I said, okay, good enough, I don't, you know. <laughs> and then after a year or two, after a couple of years, now it's just wonderful. In the spring, it's all in the, in the winter, all the yellow daisies. And then by midsummer, half of it's the white daisies. And I've never, done anything until I did water this summer. Because, and they're growing in decomposed granite on top of what is now 18-year-old um, um, landscape cloth, or 15-year-old, old landscape cloth. So they don't really grow in soil. But that's an excellent example of one of the things that we need to warn ladies about. That you're going to love these plants if they are going to spread. So don't come complaining that it's taken over your bed. That's the whole idea. It's for it to grow, right? So your maintenance is now cleaning up the margins and transplanting those somewhere else or bringing them to our plant site. Okay, this is the four season garden. There's always somebody that wants a plant that will bloom year round, right? So I have a 100% guaranteed fall season bloomer right there. This is all the time. No problem. I think that's a horse that I see. I iron big sunflower. So the four seasons are going to have a little bit more because four seasons, right? So we got the pop and palm, some wood bonnets, got to have that. Some salvia great guy, chili pekins, fall asters, and the Lindheimer muley. The Lindheimer muley is so pretty this year, at least ours is. So there's a few blue bonnets. We all love our blue bonnets. Everybody has 10 different ways to make them grow. Um, all I can say is keep after it. They will take off sooner or later. Blue bonnets, interestingly enough, are host of the gray hair streak and the Easter tail blue butterfly, neither one of which you can actually see when they're on the plant. <laughs> but they're really cute. Autumn sage, we love autumn sage. Uh, textile loves autumn sage. All the city landscape crews love autumn sage. This is a great plant, but it is one that you, if you don't cut it back, it will get big and woody. We had one, we didn't cut, I didn't cut it back for like three years. It took me three years to get it back under control. Because you can only cut so much at a time, right? Um, so if you but if you print it in midsummer, it'll come back in the fall and way more and more. In the fall, in the fall, I cut it back by about half. In the spring, as soon as there's green showing at the base, I cut it down to about an inch or two. And I mean, that plant, that plant's what, two feet high, two and a half? Cut it off. And in the fall, you just cut it back. Yeah, in, the, in mid summer, I just cut it back by about half. You know, you, you don't want to get down into the woody part if you want it to come back and bloom again in the fall. So when it starts getting the thicker woody parts, then I start cutting back. Fall aster is my favorite native plant next to blue bonnets. These bloom in late October, right when the monarchs are coming back. And the monarchs are so pretty on them, that bright orange against those parts. These are dependable bloomers. When I go look at all the pictures I have of fall asters, they're all within a five day period in October, between the 20th and the 25th, except for one year they bloom on the 12th. I don't know why. This is a great plant, but it does require a little bit of work. In the spring, when it gets to eight inches tall or 10 inches tall, you want to cut it back a couple of inches. And then about every three weeks, you go back and cut it back again. 
you'll be able to see where you cut it back the first time, it will make five little branches coming out. So when those start getting tall, then you come back and cut them, and each one of those five will make five more. And you keep doing that until the beginning of August, and then you just stop and sit back and wait for the show. Yes, ma'am. Around you're saying cut it down to eight inches in the spring. Well, I'm gonna cut mine down to about one inch. Yeah. Um the next time I get out there, because they're starting to leave out already at the base. You can cut those down to about I only leave an inch so that I can see where the plants are. And then they'll come back. But when they get to be about eight or ten inches, that's when I start cutting them back. It's painful. <laughs> but it is the one time you can use those big garden shears, you know, because you just go around and cut it back and, and it looks weird, but just only for a little while because it pops back out. Um, and it's so worth it. Otherwise, we'll just end up with a 18 inch or two inch stem and five little blades at the end of it. And that's not a happy, happy look. Chili Pekins, fun little, fun little shrub. I think we call it a ground cover. It does take it to three years to get its roots in though. So it's a great plant. Um, wildlife loves it. Does well in full shade. Does well in the sun. Doesn't do well in wet places. Awesome Ma Holly, we love those. I'm telling one of those, you drive along and you, I mean, especially right out here where Northwest Highway is the red paper come off of um, 75, there's that big stand of them. Really pretty. You do want to print them if you want to keep them compact. Um, you do want to make sure you get a female plant. I got an emergency phone call last year from this friend of ours, and she goes, I'm at the nursery and I don't know how to tell if it's a female plant. And I said, well, look at the branches right here. And you'll be able to see if it's starting to have little buds coming up that's getting ready to bloom. Or you're very likely to be able to find dried up berries still hanging on it from last year. So look for that. If you don't see that, you're just going to end up with a male holly, which is really a cool plant. It's a good plant, but you're not going to have this, these red berries. In there. And don't you need to plant a male plant somewhere? No. There's so many hollies in this area. So will it will it um, germinate from like any holly pollen, or does it need to be possible holly pollen? You got to bloom and fruit. From whatever pollinates it. No. I mean, one, I did one of those in Dallas, and I think that, well, that one is, that one that says 421. I mean, it's just out there by itself. We don't have another possum hog. I've seen them down in the creek by like four or five blocks from us. You know, but those are just more females. Um, they're just everywhere anyway. They might be, Carolyn, they might like self pollinating or something since it's only females. Don't know the answer. When it comes to pollinators, yes. Yeah. I've never seen somebody with a female that could never get it to bloom or berry. Lindheimer Mewy love this plant because in the summer it's big and fluffy and happy, and in the winter it's very upright still and that beautiful amber color. Uh, this is a great alternative to a shrub. Now we think, oh, we got to have a shrub, it's got branches, it's got leaves, you know, it's green year round. No, we need something that's going to fill a space about that size. 
when Hammer Mealy will do it. It is a gorgeous plan. Here's the Texas Story Garden. That would certainly look purposeful in your yard. <laughs> plants, coneflower, Indian blanket, yokons, pale yucca. We love the coneflowers. One of our master gardeners one year had 50 coneflowers that showed up tie dyed ones. We want to watch it. That's kind of cool. Uh, these are great for cut flower arrangements. They'll, they'll last forever. And as y'all know, they bloom from April to September. Indian blanket. You never grow Indian blanket until I just bought a bunch of seed and threw it in the back alley. And then we had a whole ton of it. Uh, good stuff. These poor soil. Very cool water. Um, do you have to cut it back in February? Everything has to be cut back then. Um, it's also great for cut flowers. Yohan Holly. I think when we first moved here, I thought it must be a rule that you had to have a Yohan Holly and a Crank Yeah. We still have the Yohan Hollies. Um, great little tree. Not really any need to talk much about it. Just watch out for those little elm butterflies because they're cute. Hell yeah, this is another alternative to a shrub. It's another great plant for putting under your window. I mean, you just don't get that kind of texture from a lot of other things. Do assistant borders. This is a big deal from our son that lives in White Plain. They have the best of herd of deer. Um, it, it might be an issue for some of y'all. It's, it's an issue for us up in Denton County because we have a lot of people that have, you know, land out in the country and stuff. But so here we have the Evergreen Sumac, Sunizo, Gum Mealy, and Lantanas because even here won't be Lantana. Evergreen Sumac, beautiful, um, beautiful blooms, beautiful leaves, great berries. Sunizo, we already talked about. Golf Mealy, you just gotta love those pink waves in the fall. Nothing beats those. And Texas Lantana, the most hybridized plant in the nursery industry. Um, one of those little pink and purple ones, they're not native. The pollinators in this area in general do not see them and do not feed on them. If you don't believe me, plant one and then go sit and watch it. You will almost never see anything near it. Um, so encourage your folks to go get an orange one, get a red one. Those are the native versions. And also to plant it where they're not walking right next to it very much, because they only kind of sticky. Yes, ma'am. I don't know. It is hard to find them. Yeah. But that's why it's our job in the Native Plant Society to try to get them in our land cycles. So, we, the one kind of garden we didn't talk about here was shade or really very wet ones. Um, on our Trendy Forks website, we do have. Plant list by garden type, shade, butterfly, so forth, and by plant type. You're aware that we're redoing all the websites, right? All the state websites. Okay. Are you the webmaster? You are? Lucky you. Yeah. I'm just the backup, so I'm sweating. Anyway, there's lots of places to get information, but you're welcome to come visit our um, website and grab some garden lists before. We have to figure out where to put them, the new ones. And if you want a beautiful garden with lots of birds and butterflies in it, then plant them they did. And there's our information about us. Our, team, our plant sale this year will be on April the 29th. This is the day for y'all to come west. Because the Denton County Master Gardener plant sale is also on April 29th. <laughs> Boy, are we thrilled. Uh, but theirs is from 9 to 3. 
one, nine to one, and now we're using ten to one. I will tell you last year we fell down at 11 15. <laughs> so this year we're going to have a whole lot more plants and everybody will be at the best. It's our plant sales, so come on up. Come on. And that's it. So we just want to help, help our Question: My husband just really wants us to put a Japanese maple in the front. He likes that red. What can I put that it's going to be a native, but it will stay small, but will have that kind of uh, yeah, the the type of um, the way the trunk looks. A plain leaf sumac will turn red in the fall, and. Um, they're not quite as tree looking. Carol has an idea. Carolina and Buckthorn. Carolina Buckthorn. Thank you. There you go. Yes, sir. Like kind of how you have to cut back and stick that. Like we're we're newbies for sure. You know, we just bought a house and um, we're by Dallas too, so we're trying to. Kind of incorporate these, but it's hard, you know, you're looking for the list, and then you're like, oh, wait, there are things you have to be on that. Is it typically like the um, the, you can just look it up and and the plant will tell you exactly what it means, or like, no, what are usually, if you if you look on the uh wildflower.org database, they've got pretty good maintenance information. If you get into our native landscape certification classes, if you'll take level one, then you can take level three. And then you get a spreadsheet that has 135 plants, the 135 most common plants, and it tells you month by month what you need to do to them. And it's, it's, the, it's the fabulous tool, the fabulous tool. The other thing is when you buy a plant, look at the label, as often it'll be there, and talk to the people that are selling it to you. In general, and this is very generalized, Carol's probably going to throw something at me, but <laughs> when, a, when a plant looks dead, white, and when you see the green stuff coming up around the bottom, then you go cut it. Now, I've talked a lot in the past about hollow plants and how native bees nest in them. And that's true. So when I go trim back a little bit at the beginning of fall, I kind of look for if it's a hollow stem plant, I try to leave it as long as I possibly can. And when I'm starting to pull my hair out, I go cut it off and then put that off to the side and let it sit until the very middle of May when the bees come out. I don't even know if there's any in there, but they, they nested in my watering can spout this year. So, <laughs> oh well, <laughs> yes, ma'am. Back to the fall. Did I have you? Yeah. Well, like right now, they're done. In the spring, do you have good soil? That's probably the problem. You know, I mean, we really want to think that we can just take a native plant and put it because it's native soil, right? But no, it's not. The native soil was hauled away years ago, and we have to rebuild something similar to that. If it's yellowy, then that's what for or something. Roses, yeah. Yeah. All right, artificial. But you can always you do, 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 a soil, do, do a soil test. Do a soil test. Do a soil test and send it in. The Aggie Lab is they're slow right now. But if you wait until March or April, by the time they tell you what to do, it'll be harvest time in September. So if you need to get a soil test done, do it right now. Go to aggiehorticulture.org. Search soil test. You know, yeah, you can just step Google step back step what to do. Tamu soil test. Yep. Yeah, yeah, you. Texas A and M University soil test. What if you wanted to test for something hot? 
I'm not sure if I do that or not. Well, it could have been that, you know, somebody laid a bag of cement there for too long and it leached in or, you know, spilled salt or, I mean, there's lots of things that could have happened, but that's where you put a container with something for it to see. <laughs> or you, you, a garden sculpture, a nice boulder, you know. So, but, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thanks for the making the information that she has um is PDF and we're getting up. But as um uh, say, things changing up on the book site, so a lot of times it's gonna be big around we're gonna just have to up and up and up and up to and up and up and up and up and right away, these things happen with PDFs, and if you're really wanting them, um uh, email me. Because I got them and I'll be glad to send them. Yes, ma'am. So, that will be on our website under plant information. Yeah, the plant information. Yeah, hopefully, you will. So, they'll be there. So, go to the Dallas chapter of NIMSOT and all the stuff that will be there. Do we know who our next month's speaker is? Um, yes, next month we will have Amy Martin, Amy Martin. and uh, Christy Kerr-Leonard. Thank you. Christy Kerr-Leonard, and they're going to talk about the Ned, Ned Fritz. Uh, and his, the reason I'm putting it in, I don't know if you can pick them. Yeah, I we're blue. Yep. Um, and Ned Fritz is. Um, a deserved legend in the native plant movement, especially when it comes to trees, and is credited with saving the Great Tr Trinity Forest. He's, yeah, he's no longer with us, but um, Amy is writing an online book about it. Amy Martin is a, a local naturalist and writer. She used to be, uh, she used to be in the newspaper. Stuff. She's, you know, a professional journalist. And she's taken to writing books lately. So, yes, and the, her, so there, I can only imagine what a talk by those two is going to be because yeah. they're just such vibrant people. Yeah. I happened to see it, uh, see your presentation at the okay. Sierra Club meeting last week, yeah. which I watched. Fabulous. Yeah. <laughs> um, group of us have started gathering. Um, at a local Mexican restaurant for uh, food and especially some adult beverages. <laughs> <laughs> a meeting.